Balake. Where is Balake at? My name's Blake. Do you want to go to war, Balake? I'm for real. A.A. Ron. A.A. Ron is present, everyone. Thank you for joining me. I'm joined once again by channel favorite, the legend, Captain Tommy Scoville. Thanks for joining me. I am so happy to be here. Seriously, I love coming on this channel. This is, uh, this is, my, favorite, uh, this is my favorite place to visit. Great audience. I love having you on. Um, for those who may not already be familiar, Captain Tommy Scoville's channel is called The Life Boat. It says, um, let me see, the story of how a convicted bank robber and addict came out of prison, a changed man with a dream. This is how Captain Tommy started The Life Boat. And so you deal with, um, uh, it, it's not, it, it, is it recovering from substances, uh, but also recovering from life in prison? What, what's the focus? I just want to tell everyone again. I mean, truthfully, it's just living your best life. The, uh, most, of the, most of the techniques that people use to get off of, uh, of, of drugs um, are the same things that you apply to just about anything that's, uh, that's destroying your life. But there's definitely a really heavy bend to people that are trying to get sober. But it, uh, just living your best life. That's awesome. Pretty, po pretty, positive, uh, pretty positive channel. That's and then, cool. then massive rants on things that absolutely fascinate me. And uh, uh, Scientology does. It just, I think there are so many parallels. It's, it's, uh, it's fascinating. You know, the, uh, the, the jail of sorts that, uh, you know, that people are, uh, are forced into if they're in the Sea Org compared to the jail that, uh, you know, that I was forced into for the things that I did. There's some, there really are a lot of similarities. It's, it's frightening to say that, but there are a lot of similarities. Yeah, it's true. But today's um, great. We're going to offend a bunch of people today, right? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> um, I, I want to tell everyone real quick, though, about what a small world it is, because not only did um, I, I, the first time we spoke on my channel was because uh, you had a lot of input on what Danny Masterson would be facing uh, being, you know, walking into prison for the first time. And so you and I started chatting about that. But it turns out and we won't we won't name him. But you right. you and I, you and I share a common friend who is an OT8 Scientologist who was one of my closest friends before I got declared and in your history was a very close friend of yours as well. It's such a crazy small world. Well, you know what? You know what's really crazy too is that uh um the time frame that I was hanging out with him. This was occurring to me yesterday, but that you were in LA about the same time. Did you meet him in LA or did you meet him in Clearwater? So my wife has known him for much longer than I have. And I don't think I actually met him until after we left and we're in Clearwater and we were hanging out socially, but I'm pretty sure my wife knew him when she was still in the Sea Org. Okay. Cause I, I, used, to, I used to spend a lot of time with him uh, when, when he lived out in LA. But the funniest part of that story is when, when the, I, he tried to, uh, to, to recruit me into, uh, into Scientology and, uh, and the first conversation we had, uh, his take on other religions and what made them really wacky was, you know, the, uh, any kind of mythology attached to it. You know, you have to believe in this entity or you have to believe in this God. What, what, uh, he said really attracted him to, him to Scientology was there was none of that. This was just, man, this is science. You know, you hook yourself up to this machine and there's nothing more than that. So well, the first time you said to me, yeah, he's OT8, I thought I would have <laughs> loved to have been there to, to say, Hey, wait a second. Yeah. No, no belief. I mean, have you heard of this guy named Zenu? <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. So you and I were chatting yesterday, the day before, and you, uh, the subject of was L Ron Hubbard, a drug addict came up. Now here's one of the reasons I'm interested in talking about this because I tend to get very defensive on this subject. When people bring up L, L. Ron Hubbard was an alcoholic, L. Ron Hubbard was a drug addict and not because I particularly care whether he was or he wasn't. Um, but I've always been a little suspicious about the, the data points that exist out there. Some of them are from his son or his grandson. I can't quite remember. Um, and so I'm interested to see what you've got on this so okay. we can discuss it. And, and I'll give you my perspective or, or at least the, the Scientology perspective on these sure. things. Because yeah, this I, is I just going to so. be a fun chat about this. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. But I, I'll preface it with this. Um, I didn't start going down this road um, from, I, I mean, I, I went down the scholarly side of this where I just started trying to do some deep dives and see if anybody had ever taken a look at it, but not out of the blue. I started watching a bunch of stuff uh, from L from LRH and I, you know, where there are films of him out there and there's a lot of audio tapes out there and there's a lot of other things, but 
when you start doing some history on him and you hear about these sessions where he wrote for 26 hours or he wrote for 27 hours. And uh, even if you're into the groove, that's a bizarre thing, right? That's really, really odd. It's not odd, however, at all, if you are taking amphetamines. And this was sort of the, the, the first thought that I had. And then you start to read things from, say, wife number two, who just said that the paranoia got so unbelievable. And there are so many different uh, stories about um, through the progression and the paranoia. And I've watched just a lot of people in my life go down the amphetamine road. Then his kid, whose name is Nibs, as you, you know, as I mentioned the other day, this kid did a, uh, an interview with, uh, with Penthouse Magazine. And he also did, he was on a couple of television shows. If you want a deep dive, there's a lot you can see on Nibs, who was Ron Jr. Uh, his last name was DeWitt, I think. But he did a lot of stuff in the mid 80s, early and mid 80s. So he was, he made the rounds, but it made it, it, it was read into court record that um, he definitely had uh, a, uh, a taste for drugs. And the fact is that um, undeniably he spent a ton of time with uh, a Jack, you know, with Jack Parsons, the guy that uh, started JPL or the guy that JPL was named after, right? He was a, a rocket scientist in the U S but he was a rocket scientist in the U S that ran the ODO, right? Which was the, um, I think I said that right. Uh, the audio oh, something templates. Yeah. The, the OTO, right? OTO. There you go. Thank you. OTO. Uh, which was an uh, a uh, an American. This was the American offshoot of Aleister Crowley's deal. Well, Crowley's, Crowley's, um magic is sex magic. It's it's pretty uh, cut and dry stuff, and it's also really laden with drugs. I mean, he was uh, he was a firm advocate of the fact that if you wanted to to uh, do black magic, that drugs were absolutely a part of it, and so was ritual sex magic of. Um, of all, of all kinds, pretty wild stuff. In today's standards, not a big deal. We have entire months that are dedicated to that kind of stuff. But when he was doing it, it was a fairly big deal. And I think it's kind of ironic because of all of the teachings of Scientology when it would come to things like, it. but if you go back and it, it would seem very, very odd to me, Aaron, that, uh, that this guy would be spending any time with Jack Parsons, period. But it was far more than that. Like he was deep into the sex rituals and, uh, and all of those things. And According to his his uh, his kid, you know, the uh, the second book, the one that was written after Dianetics. And, you know, by by most standards, Dianetics, wouldn't you say that the reason that most people get involved in this uh, in the Church of Scientology is because Dianetics has got stuff to offer? Yeah, I'm to be honest, most people don't get into Scientology through Dianetics anymore. Um, but, you know, in the old days, Dianetics was marketed as like a mental science, uh, a common man, psychotherapy. Anyone can read the book and partner up and audit and, you know, get rid of painful traumatic experiences and think more clearly. I think that was its appeal, like back in the early 50s. And then and then the second book comes out, which is a little bit more um, uh, out there. There's 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 more elements of uh, of like a religious mythology kind of a thing to that. So I'll tell you what, the second book was called um, Science of Survival, uh, unless I'm missing one, but I don't think that I am. Science of Survival got more into the emotional tone scale. But I think, I believe the book that L. Ron Hubbard Jr. was talking about, um, uh, where they heavily used drugs, was a book called, I think in the beginning, it might have been called, have uh, 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 actually, I was about to say, have you lived before this life? It used to be called what to audit, but the book that he was talking about might've been Scientology, a, a, a history of man. Yeah. That's uh, his, uh, yes. By the way, just real quick. Can you just tap your mic and make sure we're still plugged into the right mic? All right. That doesn't sound right. Are we going in and out? Just, just, so, just do your little drop down menu on your settings for a stream yard okay. and see if it's the right one. Seconds. It, it says <laughs> just like I accidentally uh, kicked myself out of the stream <laughs> on the last stream. I think Tommy just did the same. <laughs> anyway, guys, if you're in front of a computer or you've got uh, a browser window open on your phone, you might just do a Google search for Scientology history of man it is one of the wackier scientology books i mean it might be the wackiest i am pretty sure that um let me see if tommy i'm gonna text tommy uh uh let's see 
let me know if you need a link. Uh, here he is. <laughs> Tommy's back. And this is why we're not allowed to have nice things right right here. You know what I mean? Don't, don't let me near anything electronic. This says it's hooked up, but it is not. But I'm going to have to. Uh, That's so all right. Well, we'll, we'll I will going. project. How would that be? So it's, no, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. But uh, um, okay, go ahead. Yeah, so Scientology, A History of Man is the book that if anyone has ever heard that Scientologists think we've evolved from clams, um, that is the book <laughs> where that comes from. Well, that that there's some history there, too, because in the interview with Nibs, uh, Ron Jr., he said that his dad fed him a, a bunch of amphetamines and he started to basically rant and he didn't start with this progression going back. He actually started at the clam. Like he started talking to, uh, according to him, he started talking to his father about it. But that was the, that was the, uh, the start, according to the kid. Now, I mean, it's, I'm sure that it's fairly easy to, uh, you know, there are people who are going to discredit the son, to be sure, right? But again, if you just look at, if you look at the behavior, um, anyone that's, I don't like using all of the drug terms for people's names because it kind of, but you know, people use the term tweaking. And this is the most published guy in the entire world, right? And I mean, admittedly, if he wrote, uh, hey, this was Ron on the back of a cigarette you know, pack, somebody uh, published it so that he would be the most published person on the planet. But he wrote, he was a prolific science fiction writer. And it just, it seems to me like this guy spent a lot of time awake and a lot of time sitting in front of either a, uh, uh, a typewriter or sitting and speaking into something. The, the, the volume of stuff that he created and the amount of time that he was alive, I have a struggle believing this guy wasn't doing amphetamines. Hmm. So the only thing that I immediately think of that, I, that, that, that tends to contradict the idea. Well, uh, let me take a half step back. There's obviously a difference between someone drinking and someone being an alcoholic or someone doing drugs and someone being a drug addict, right? I just, I don't doubt for a second that L. Ron Hubbard drank um, excessively and took drugs in, at various times. I just mm -hmm. feel like if he was addicted to any of these things or if it was a habit, uh, that all the messengers, the, you know, the young messengers who basically catered to him 24 seven for at least a dozen of, of, of his, of his last active years leading up to 1980 when he went off into seclusion, these people, I mean, these young, mostly girls catered to him to such a degree. They helped him get dressed in the morning. They would, they helped wake him up in the morning. They helped, helped put him to bed at night. They helped lay out his clothes. They ran his errands. They did his shopping for him. They did everything. And I just, I don't recall any of them mentioning anything about this. Uh, you know, J Janice Gillum Grady uh, hosts the, the YouTube channel, Our Scientology Stories, Peeling the Onion with Mark Fisher. She worked directly for L. Ron Hubbard as his messenger for a dozen years. And I'll have to ask her specifically about this, but she's been telling so many stories the last many months and nothing like this specifically has come up. Now, you know, if you, I would ask her about just the behavior because it, a lot of times it's really easy to get a, a picture in your head of, oh, there's just no way that that could be, or there's no way it could be that guy. But what, what, how much time did this guy sleep over the course of an average week? For real, like how much time did he spend awake? What were his eating habits? Like the kind of things that really point to, because we're not talking about a, a, a substance that there's a huge ritual, right? To, to get amphetamines into your body. Like you're not going to have to sit down and tie off and cook something up and, and create, you know, the six or seven minute ritual that you do five times a day, you can be caught doing, you know, he could be swallowing, you know, two or three pills a couple of times a day. And I don't know the, the, the behavior, especially how he just seemed to get progressively more paranoid and more weird as time went by. Now that could also be uh, mental illness, but I think that there was a dose of both. Again, Nib said that, um, you know, when they, when he was asked if his dad did drugs, he said from the age of 16 on, you know, that he, he did a lot of different, and, and some of the stuff, peyote, um, psilocybin, you know, psychedelic mushrooms, these aren't things you're, you're going to get addicted to in the first place. And these are things he probably, uh, you know, if you experiment with, you're going to be for the rest of your life, you know, you were a guy that did mushrooms or you were a guy that did LSD. I think that was probably a time when, when people experimented with that, but the, uh, the cocaine and the, um, the amphetamines that his son talked about was, I don't know, it, the behavior, the behavior matches, let's say that. 
Oh, his son specifically said that? His, his son specifically said, and I quote, he was asked um, by the, uh, the reporter, did your dad do, uh, do a lot of drugs? He said, yes, since he was 16. You see, drugs are a very important part of the uh, applica application of uh, full black magic. The personal use of drugs breaks open um, the, uh, the door to the deep, and my father was deeply involved. And when he was asked specifically what drugs, he said uh, cocaine and amphetamines mostly, but he did um, peyote uh, and a lot of barbiturates when it came time to sleep. And that is another one of the things that you see with, especially back in the day, you know, people that, that used uh, amphetamines as a way to, to, to work and build an empire, you know, the, uh, the Playboy, um, you know, the, uh, the, the empire that uh, was built by the founder of Playboy, he said the same thing. He said he was, he wrote every single article for the first year, you know, and he would just take um, amphetamines, in his case, dexedrine and work around the clock. And then he would take barbiturates to go to sleep, you know, when he realized that if he didn't, his teeth were going to fall out or he was, you know, losing so much weight. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, I think that there was a lot of it that went on and to write as prolifically as he did. I mean, hmm. when did he eat? When do you do anything? Well, if he wasn't lecturing, speaking into a machine or typing. Interesting. So. And throw in Jack Parsons. Very odd guy to hang out with. I, I, I think it's, it's a stretch to think he was deeply involved in the kind of um, sex magic rituals that that Crowley was a, uh, you know, the the most famous um, practitioner of. I struggle to think that he was doing the, well, I'd like to sleep with these people and screw around with him, but I'm not doing any of these, uh, these heavy drugs you guys are doing. I just want to kind of dip my toe into this uh, sex orgy. <laughs> oh, I have zero doubt about what Hubbard was doing in his early, uh, in his early days. Let me think, how old would he have been when, so he was born in 1911, Dianetics came out in 1950 so he would have been 39 right so i have yeah. no doubt that in his 20s and 30s he was doing absolutely anything and everything he could get his hands on um yeah. i i just have no i have no doubt about that there's no reason to believe otherwise i mean <laughs> right you know and and all drugs create um kind of a uh, of a pathology of dishonesty if you're if you're using drugs, often there are lies that that go along with them because hey, what well, where were you four hours ago? Sometimes requires a uh, a bit of a falsehood because you were off shooting dope or buying dope or whatever. But it seems like he got to a point where he was pathological. Like if he, if he was speaking, he was lying, right? He um, if you look at his his DDT, the thing that you get when you leave uh, the DD two fourteen or whatever you get when you leave uh, the military, and compare it to his stories, it's absolutely remarkable, right? And it just seems like this, in my experience, and I've worked with a lot of people who do drugs, uh, people who don't sleep, the drugs that keep you awake for days on end um, tend to get really lost and into the deep end when it comes to dishonesty. And a lot of times they begin to believe it. Yes. You know, one thing I do believe that I recall Janice saying is that he tended to work all night and not sleep until the sun came up. Is that in your experience, an indicator of, of drug use, or can you just be on a really bad schedule? Well, I mean, yeah, you absolutely can, you know, the, the whole circadian cycle thing can get turned on its, on its ear. And there are people who work in her and say, and I'm that guy, like if I'm in the middle of doing something, I'm, I'm doing a deep dive or whatever, sometimes I'll, I'll go for way longer than I should. But um, amphetamines make it really difficult to sleep. Right. Amphetamines that, you know, what they do is they speed up your heart rate. They do, they do all kinds of things in the body, including, stimulating the mind and really getting it going. It's not just the physical, uh, you know, aspects of it. It's the fact that your brain is cooking in overtime, but you know, there, there's an interview that you can find out there and it's labeled within uh, a uh, Z E I mean, X E M U instead of N U Z M U. Mm -hmm. That interview is uh, and it's L Ron Hubbard talking. It's his, it's him speaking and telling the entire tale of it. And uh, and if any of you have ever have been addicted to uh, amphetamines, if any of you have ever done any any speed drug at all, go listen to this and just tell me your humble opinion. Because when I came across this one, I was like, this is, and again, I'm not offending anybody because I am in this. This is what I do for, for my life. But he's tweaking. If you listen to it, it is, I mean, you can you can hear him pause as he's as he's twisting the lie or backing up to it, to, you know, to, to tweak it just a little bit. It's an it's an amazing clip. I will uh, I'll throw it wow. to you, but, but you it's know, about 20 minutes of it. It is interesting what you say right there, because 
I know people uh, who work in the drug recovery industry and have it, it almost like the way I can say, I can tell if someone's a Scientologist, the way they look at me when I walk by them, uh -huh. uh, the, the people I know can tell if someone's on any type of a drug, just without, without a problem in a second. Without and a problem. So the reason why I think what you're saying there is really interesting is most Scientologists I know do not have drug histories or major drug histories. And so if L Ron Hubbard in his lectures and whatever was exhibiting symptoms of that, it would just go right over their head. They right. would have, they would have no idea. Although our friend, the OT8, <laughs> I'd love to talk to him. He would never talk to me, but I would love to talk to him because he had, he had history. I guarantee you he knows. That, that's, one of those, uh, that's one of those things that he absolutely would have come across. The problem yeah. with fixing watches is there could be 200 of them that are beeping and you never know which one it is. <laughs> okay, Plus, I wanted to bring this comment up so that I could say something about it. Juliana Bittencourt, <laughs> the science theologist. I love it. Juli I know Juliana. Um, but how reliable is Nibs though? Not saying it isn't true. Just take anything Nibs says with a grain of salt. So this is worth just commenting on. Again, I'm more interested in your personal take on how Elwin Hubbard sounds combined with yeah. what Nibs says. The problem with Nibs is he's one of these guys kind of like Marty Rathbun who went back and forth. Back and forth. He, yeah. he was out. He was in. He was out. He was in. When he was out, he said, everything I said when I was in was a lie. When he came back, he said, everything I said when I was out was a lie. And the truth is, of course, somewhere in the middle there. Right. And I got to tell you, when I hear, when I think back now to hearing the stories of L. Ron Hubbard writing entire books without even taking a break or okay. writing a second draft, you're like, yeah, that's not normal. <laughs> no, that's really, really not normal. But so much of the other behavior that you hear reported is. I'll tell you this, too. Um, it's not Nibs is just Nibs is writing. You can go out and see him a lot on video. And I will tell you straight out, um, he's full of shit. Like he's, he's one of those people that when you watch, um, he's, he's, he's slimy. He's one of those people that, you know, I've met a million people like him and you watch him and you do, you don't get that. You do not get the vibe that, that, um, he is probably a guy that you can count on. And I, I and I will absolutely throw that out. But I think you take it as as part of a of kind of a mosaic. Um, again, you know, the, the longer you're in, especially with amphetamines, especially with cocaine, any of the drugs that uh, keep you in, um, you know, for, as you stay addicted to it, the longer you stay in with the drugs that keep you awake, the more paranoid you get, the more the more kind of bizarre the uh, thought processes. And I work with people, you know, every every week where a guy calls me who hasn't slept in six days. You know, and he's getting ready to get off of this stuff. And it's it's difficult for a person to uh, to articulate. But if you find those people whose brains cook on it, you know, I mean, those people who can absolutely sit down at a typewriter, the uh, the stuff that comes out of their head is bizarre. And it seems to me like th think again, uh, Aaron, from this point of view, is there anything he didn't write about? I mean it. Like if you're a Scientologist and you say, well, I've got a beef with Aaron because um, he stole a shovel from my house. They're, they're always like, don't trip. LRH wrote on the, what do you do if the neighbor steals a shovel? I'll go get it. Right. It's I almost mean, this guy bizarre. wrote about down to the details of the right way to clean a window, the right way to dust, the right way to feed a baby. Um, I, I mean, uh, the <laughs> it, it was crazy. Nothing further. No, I, I, I'm, but I'm being, I'm being serious. No, and, and Tommy, and everything, and everything he opined on, he opined on it as if this, he was the world's utmost expert on this subject because of his whole track past life recall. And I'm glad that you said that because <laughs> if we track back the whole life recall, there was a guy that worked for him. What the heck was his name? Armstrong? Does that sound, does that ring a bell? Jerry Armstrong? Jerry uh, Armstrong. Uh, he yeah, was he well. I, I don't know. Keeper. Well, Jer Jerry Armstrong became. He was going to be L. Ron Hubbard's biographer. Um, I don't remember if Jerry Armstrong actually personally knew L. Ron Hubbard, but I could absolutely be wrong about that. Well, he's the one that found apparently, or he he was there with the crew that found Excalibur uh, one and two. Is it Excalibur? No, the Black Sword. What the hell is it called? Yeah, Excalibur, the Dark Sword. But the this was the book that L. Ron Hubbard wrote that if you read it, your genitals fell off or something like that. It was, it was pretty heavy stuff. You didn't just, you, you couldn't take reading this lightly. It killed everyone that read it. Did you hear this? That's what L. Ron Hubbard said. You'd go crazy yes. just reading the manuscript, but I don't think the manuscript ever really existed. 
Well, apparently, this is this is a claim from. Well, let me see here. I can I can almost footnote this. Um, the the documentary is called Secret Lives, nineteen ninety seven UK from okay. the UK, All right. um, and uh, they do a thing on LRH, and then they talk to this, to a person. Apparently, they there were uh, two different versions that they say were found among his estate, but also among his estate is something that that made reference to you know when he died on the uh, at the while getting a filling. <laughs> I don't know what he was doing. I'm being I'm being a wise guy. That was that wasn't that's not cool. I, I think he, there was some story of him having some dental procedure and he left his body and he obtained some secret knowledge or some shit like that. Yeah. Have you ever done nitrous oxide by any chance? No, but I've heard you can have that experience. Okay. Cause I've done a grip of it. Like I, uh, I have spent many, many, many a night hooked up to not just nitrous oxide, but nitrous oxide cut with oxygen. So you can breathe it for longer periods of time. And one of the effects of nitrous oxide is that you do lose your, your equilibrium. So as you're sitting in the chair, you feel that, you know, you, you, you sort of left and it, uh, it definitely leads to, but apparently there was some, uh, some documentation according to Jerry Armstrong in this documentary that uh, he came across some things that referenced um, the fact that it probably wasn't death as much as it was nitrous oxide. <laughs> It's a, it is a uh, it is a documentary worth reading. But once again, I will I will chalk up nibs. I, I'm willing to chalk up a whole lot of things that you say. You know what? It's it's hard to tell if anybody doesn't have an axe to grind, or or, or they just want a little fame. Or sure. But I think that I think if you started taking the number of words that this cat wrote or spoke into something, right? And just do the, the, the words and start dividing it into the number of minutes that this man spent on the planet. And I defy you, right, to say that this guy averaged two or three hours of sleep a night. That is an unusual behavior for people who are, look, I mean, if you, there are people who go through cycles, right? There are, you know, I, I've uh, seen people often who, who self-medicate and when they stop, you know, they go through two or three weeks of, uh, of, you know, sort of really that manic kind of they can do anything. And then there's the big crash afterwards. Now, Nibs could be lying, but Elrond certainly uh, spent a lot of time hanging out with people that did um, that did drugs, you know, that were into it. Yeah. And certainly the guy who's the guy whose girlfriend he stole and ran away <laughs> after a business deal. And yeah. the, uh, his relationship with Parsons is fascinating. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll tell you what, real, and we'll get to Jack Parsons, of course. Um, there is a letter. I've seen this letter widely reported on. And for the life of me, I can't remember if it's a letter that he wrote to Mary Sue Hubbard at some point, or if it was a letter that he wrote to his second wife that he claims to have never had. And it, it talked about, um, basically, I'm surviving on rum and popping the, the, the pinks and the grays. Second, and, second wife. The second wife and the pinks and the grays obviously refer to some sort of medication. Any idea what that might have been like? Just um, you know, it's it's funny because um, there's a really good chance it's obviously an upper and a downer. Like I bet the farm on that, right? You know, it's the and it was a, a popular thing at the time. Pinks in that day and age would probably have been second all or two and all the which was a, a barbiturate, and he was apparently fond of barbiturates. So the pink, I would almost be willing to bet, was uh, either second all or two and all. But depending on where the letter was uh, was written from, you know, that gets confusing too because once you leave the U.S. border, it's the same drugs, but they all have different names and they're in different colors and all of that. But um, but I would imagine it was like you know um, something to take you up and something to put you to sleep. But yeah, that uh, that letter that uh, that the woman that didn't exist actually has uh, released. Um, kind of a series of his stuff and it is handwritten too. So I don't know. I'm, I'm sure that they could be documented if somebody wanted to. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> so we just verified it. He didn't have a second wife. <laughs> I know. He he never had. All right. Laura FM, a uh, good friend, Laura, a Laura Anderson here says, okay, question. Has anyone heard Ron doing LSD and witchcraft during writing the OT levels and on many pills, medication psych drugs when his body was dying so it has been widely reported um on his coroner's report there was a drug in his system and i feel like i always say it wrong it's either visitril or vistriol i can't remember some people report this as a psych drug i've seen it reported as an antihistamine i've seen it uh reported uh, discussed by some who were personally familiar with the matter that it was for his allergies or something. Uh, are you familiar with this drug, even if I'm saying it right? Visitril, um, Vistria? 
Well, it well there are a uh, there's a bunch of drugs that it could be, and um, even like Visteril, Vister Vivitrol. There, there, there are a lot of different drugs that, and and often, um, if they're talking that it's perfect for uh, for antihistamines and things like that, especially back in the day, that was usually um, amphetamines was how they treated all of those things because speeding up the heart rate you know, tended to decongest. It also tended to help with asthma. It helped with a lot of things. So very often um, they were prescribed uh, um, and they were under a bunch of different names, but they, they were just amphetamines in a pill. And we, we still do it. Now we do it with ADHD and we do it with other things, but we still prescribe very similar things. And there's one out there right now that has, it's, it's for um, second shift disorder and it's something trill. It sounds amazingly like that, but it's a newer drug. It couldn't be the same, but you know, they go for names that, uh, yeah. What does second shift disorder mean? Second shift disorder is a really nice way for a doctor to, uh, to justify writing someone a prescription for speed. So you spend 15 years being the guy you described earlier who writes until the sun comes up and then goes to sleep. Well, if that's what you do for a living, if you're a, you know, a police officer that goes on at night, um, they, uh, they have a medication, basically they, they give the person speed, but they call it second shift disorder. It's a, it's a euphemism as you know, this guy's really tired and he could use some low rent, you know, uh, prescription speed. Interesting. Let's take a look at this one. Uh, deviant outcast says, quote, if you're going to grab hold of anything, grab hold of some Benzedrine. That's a Hubbard quote. Also in the early Dianetics days, Hubbard recommended the use of methamphetamine or is that? Yeah. Methamphetamine. I do remember I do remember in one of the books, and this is one of the thing that one of the things that Miscavige has edited out of the books as time has gone on. Right. He does make mention of the use of some drug, even in in Dianetics. I could I I distinctly remember it that because um, in Dianetics sometimes he would talk about um, in some places he would talk about hypnotism and how Dianetics was not quite hypnotism and that Dianetic reverie. Um, was uh, a light, a light version of hypnotism that was light enough that you couldn't implant suggestions. And I do remember at one point saying in really tough cases, and he mentioned some drug that you can use in really tough cases. It's um, also in a video. Oh, he, there's a video of this, like the quote right here. I, I saw this and I didn't read it. So I saw, I saw a, uh, a quote that said, you know, if you got to get a hold of something, get get a hold of some Benzedrine. And Benzedrine used to be um, very available in the U.S. Uh, if there are any old uh, hippies or drug addicts on here, um, a lot of times they were marketed and people would call them cross stops because they had a, a thing that would split the pill into fourths. But Benzedrine is a uh, is a it's not an amphetamine, but it acts exactly like an amphetamine. It does the exact same thing. There was a period of time in our country where you could get that in like a Vicks inhaler it used to come with Benzedrine in it. And uh, people used to do all kinds of stuff. It is, it is absolutely no joke a drug. I mean, it is, it is speed. Um, I didn't realize that he recommended the use of methamphetamine, but, but Benzedrine is, it is very close. They're kissing cousins. It is speed. No question. Interesting. And we'll keep you awake for long periods of time. <laughs> Interesting. Was there more that you wanted yeah. to talk about regarding the Jack Parsons stuff? Well, and you know what, here's the thing, the, uh, whether or not, you know, he uses drugs to control people or any of the things because, because drugs and cults have been going on forever. I mean, they really have. This has been most most drug leaders. David Koresh was, uh, you know, uh, was uh, pretty fond of drugs. The uh, Jonestown, you know, when they finally uh, broke into uh, to the cult in French Guiana, he had mountains of amphetamines in there and uh, evidence that he was not just using them, but giving them to people. You know, the uh, the longer somebody stays awake, Aaron, nothing good happens when you deprive someone of sleep. It's why they deprive people of sleep when they want to brainwash them or do anything else. Sleep deprivation does nothing good for the human body. And if you spent from, even if Nibs is lying, you know. It's, well, it's uh, incredible that you mentioned the sleep deprivation because it's not like L. Ron Hubbard wouldn't have known that. And uh, I'll tell you, one of the biggest things in the sea org that is problematic that contributes to a horrible poor, uh, quality of life that contributes to conflict fighting strife is the intense lack of sleep not getting more than three or four four three four or five hours of sleep a night and i sort of wonder if if l run hubbard sort of created that culture because it's what he himself experienced 
And yet he's the only one who was allowed to do something about it, chemically speaking. <laughs> well, but this is, but this is every one of them. If you go, it, 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 this is every cult like this. If you go to, uh, to Jonestown where he had people out there building sheds and, and making roads and all, all of that, he would lecture them that, you know what? Yesterday he did a speech for 16 hours. You guys can't go out there and <laughs> work for 14 in the, uh, in the fields. And again, the only one that's really gassing it up. Koresh was the same way. There are, you know, you, you just have so many people that are off in the weeds doing these things. And sadly, you know, sleep deprivation is something that makes it people much more uh, susceptible to, uh, you know, to that kind of, uh, to that kind of stuff. Yeah. We mentioned the messengers earlier and um, blow drill here points out that, um, you know, when L Ron Hubbard was in his, his study or his research room or whatever the hell he called it, those messengers, like even when he was behind closed doors, those messengers stood directly outside of his door. Um, there, there were messengers surrounding him um, within uh, far enough away that he could call for them 24 seven. I mean, I would say that L Ron Hubbard probably went for months and months and months on end without even leaving that ship when they would go to port because the messengers would just do everything for him. Um, is it, so is, is your position that he was an addict or just that there was clearly chemical use? I, I don't know where you cross the line between use and dependency or whether it matters. Are you trying to make a distinction? Um, you know, in, in, in this case, I'm not the, uh, I'm, I'm my, where I, I draw the line is when you have hideous events happening in your life, right? When, when, when chemicals are causing really bad things to happen and you still cannot stop doing what you're doing, you're probably addicted. Usually it's, it's the continued use of a substance or a habit in the, in the face of, you know, tons of reasons to stop bad things happening in your life. But I think with him, um, it, I, whether or not he was, uh, he was addicted, I think it was a very large part of who this guy is. I am, I am so blown away the more I deep dive this. And I'm honestly, I'm a fan of this, uh, of this channel. I watch, and, and I'm a fan of all of SPTV, but I really dig your stuff. And it, it, it sends me down rabbit holes. So, so routinely. And it seems like the deeper I go uh, into this, the more I realize that like he probably wrote four or five pages on, on flashlights, right? There's nothing this guy, you know, didn't, he didn't just write about it. He spoke about it. He's, you know, there's, there's audios there. He was prolific to the point where if he had been 130 years old, you know, it would have been tough to pull off the amount of stuff he wrote if he had been working, say, eight hours a day. It's true. You know, I read this book. I think it's called Blitzed, if I recall correctly, and it has to do with the role of methamphetamines in the uh, the rise of the Third Reich and its role in World War II. Oh, yeah. Incredible yeah. how much the soldiers in that war, particularly on Germany's side, were just pretty much on methamphetamines the entire time. And, yeah. and the lack of sleep, the lack of sleep is part of what destroyed those soldiers. And yet the, the worse it got, the more they had to take. Well, and if they were in pain in any way, shape or form, um, they were using a painkiller that they had also, the Nazis had invented called Dolphine, which was uh, turned out to be uh, methadone. And it had, you know, three to four times the, uh, the half-life of any other of, uh, of the opiates that, that had ever been made at that time. So it was a cocktail. Once again, you had guys just walking around, you know what I mean? <laughs> Amphetamines keeping them up and, uh, and painkillers keeping them doped. And again, that lack of sleep. And it doesn't, you know, when we think of sleep deprivation, we think of, uh, you know, people throwing buckets of water in your face and, you know, shining a light on you and coming in and hitting you with a hose to make sure you don't sleep. But it takes, a, it takes on so many different forms. You know, it's like you said, if, if you're in some place and you're working and the schedule is set up in such a way that four hours of sleep is all you're going to bang out in your head, it just becomes part of life but it is a, a prolonged systematic form of sleep deprivation that is going to have long-term effects on people. Yeah. And you know, Hubbard there's, well, there's two personality traits that I'm thinking of right now. Um, one is this, uh, what's, what's the, is it a sense of grand? What is it when you, you think you're just a, like, you're like a God, this part, what, what is the word? There's a phrase. Delusions of grandeur. There grandeur. you go. Where you yeah. just think, I mean, he literally, that's almost literally what he thought about himself. Um, I mean, to call himself source 
and Scientology. No one has ever contributed anything valuable to Scientology other than some small minor things. It's all from me. We will not question as to how I came to rise above the bank. Somehow I did. I'm a big being, the biggest being there's ever been. And so the, 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 the sense of grandeur. And also what was the other one? Oh, the intense paranoia, not just about governments and the DEA and the FBI and Interpol and all that shit, but at the end of his life, he was became obsessed and infatuated that he was being haunted by the body thetans that he was supposed to already have gotten rid of to the point where he asked um, Sarge Falf to create yeah. a special high voltage version of the E-meter that would deliver him a shock sufficient to get rid of all of his body thetans and to kill the body so that he could leave his body free of body thetans. So he's going crazy. He's believing all of this bullshit that he's created. And he thinks he's like this godlike figure. I, I think you'd be crazy not to wonder what role uh, substance is played. In Bingo. This. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a real quick story that, that kind of illustrates the same kind of thing. So I, I started off running a, a little drug program for some people in prison and it ended up blowing up into a really big thing. And I ended up a, a de facto counselor, whether I wanted to be or not. And in prison, that's kind of a tough gig. But a guy came to me and he's telling me this story to make it to, to make a long story really short. Three guys got together and they were plotting on somebody and they came up with a story. And one of the guys had done so much dope that he basically believed his like he was, he was coming to me complaining about a story that didn't exist. They had created this BS and the other two are standing there going, dude, it didn't happen. Like we came up with this lie to get something done, but dude hasn't slept in four days and now believes that I really believe that over a long enough period of time, he, he became a true believer. But I think that, you know, there, there is methamphetamine induced psychosis is real. I mean, super real. You hear horror stories when you don't sleep, you know, when you go to sleep at night, your brain goes to sleep. I mean, your body goes to sleep, your brain wakes up and it works through all the BS in your life. If you do not sleep, your subconscious is going to wreak havoc. And I, I think he became a believer of what originally may have just been BS, but I think he, I definitely think drugs were a huge part of it. I really do. Um, I just sent Janice an invitation. You guys, um, I texted it to her. I don't know if she wants an email, but I sent it to her on text. Uh, if Janice joins us, she was one of the messengers who worked with LRH. So it'll be awesome. Really? To have, it'd be awesome to have her join us in the chat. Big time. I would be on, fascinated on screen. Um, a question that you asked me recently, but strangely enough, a couple other people have asked me this recently as well. And that is was substance, uh, using drugs were there Sierg, was there sort of a subculture where like some Sierg members were doing drugs kind of like I, I don't know uh, I guess the analogy is you're not supposed to do any substances in high school but everyone knows that some people are people right. ask me is was that in the Sea Org and my answer was like no <laughs> no 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 I mean I've never even heard uh, uh, of such a thing happening now people drinking sure that's I mean Anybody, technically speaking, drinking is not against the rules in Scientology. I've never heard of a Sea Org member getting busted, you know, smoking weed or doing pills or anything. Oh, this is one of the things I wanted to ask you. There were many times when Hubbard would have an injury and he, he could, I, I believe Janice has talked about getting his prescriptions for him. Well, everyone knows prescriptions can be abused. Sure. For, for sure. Is it possible that he could have had periods of his life where he was particularly up? Oh, she wants me to email her the link. I'm going to email her the link. Perfect. This is where I guess I'm trying to understand where the line exists. If it even matters between usage and addiction, or can you be acutely addicted and then come off and then be addicted again and then come off? Well, I just, it's it, this, this gets kind of confusing and it's, it would be a long show, but what, what science is finding out now is this, let's say, let's say that I have a, a predisposition to drug addiction and you don't, the two of us could do dope every single day together for the rest of our lives. And then you might say, you know what? I'm taking off for about four weeks. I kind of feel like crap. I got to get healthy for a second. And I, of course, would look at you like you're doing what? Because for the person that's addicted, that's not a possibility. It's a very difficult thing and it requires. So you can abuse drugs for five years. If you're not, if you're not somebody that is, uh, that has the gene, um, yes, it is possible to sort of go in and out of, of drug use where there are times where you're, you, you know, you abuse and then take off it. And there are addicts who get sober for six or seven months or get sober for two or three years and then they relapse. 
Um, in fact, for a lot of addicts, that's that's the reality of life is it's long periods of sobriety followed by screw ups and, and then back. Right. Did we get her? So it's possible. Um, I just sent her the email. She'll, she'll be here. So it is possible that LRH was someone who, let's just say, didn't have the gene and he could abuse, take or abuse substances for a lengthy period of time and then come off of them without. Um, what's the difference between when a true addict, someone who has the gene, as you put it, a true addict tries to come off a substance versus the, someone who isn't? What, what it comes down to is, and I think it's fascinating because it kind of goes hand in hand with everything that you talk about, but the, the difference bit comes down to the feeling that, that the drug addict has. We, we are uncomfortable in our own skin and we seek out ways to make that go away. And there's a million things that cause that discomfort. And you could, you could run them parallel, right? One person goes into an org, feels uncomfortable in their own skin. They tell somebody that. Now there's somebody sitting across from them that cares, right? It's the same thing with the drug world. All of a sudden, there's this substance that makes you feel comfortable in your own skin. And there's a whole group of people who are doing the same substance. And now you have your own language and you have your own culture, addiction and, and joining up, whether it's a cult or a church, a legit, you know, church or cult or anything else, they, those, they kind of run hand in hand, but for an addict, they're going to feel uncomfortable in their own skin to the point where it drives them back unless they get help. Hey, Janice. Hey, everybody. Hi, Aaron. Oh, your mic sounds fantastic. I'm so excited. Oh, good. <laughs> and I've got little earpieces too. Nice. Nice. <laughs> okay. So Tommy, I'd like you to meet Janice. Janice, meet Tommy. <laughs> Janice, it's Hi, an honor. Tommy. Okay. So Janice, tell Tommy how old you were when you started working as a messenger for L. Ron Hubbard. Is that your dog, Tommy. Janice? Two of them. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. They'll, they'll quiet down. They're, they're Labradoodles, big boys. <laughs> So you were how old? 12. Oh my goodness. Okay. And so you, and so you were worked as a messenger for L. Ron Hubbard for, was it 11 or 12 years? 11 years. Um, I came on the ship at 11 years old. I just turned 12 when I became a messenger and that was in 1968. And I was on the ship until 1975 with Hubbard every single day except wow. maybe a Liberty six hours a day. Wow. Along with my, there was four of us. We covered six hour watches a day. That's 24 hours. And wherever he went, we went. And then we got more messengers to the point there was three messengers with him 24 hours a day. And we had a log book and we logged everything he did. What was his sleeping schedule? He normally would secure around three o'clock in the morning. He'd go to his cabin. He might read a book or something. He'd get some sleep, maybe around five, six in the morning, sometimes eight. He'd get up, go in session, and then go back to bed. And he'd get up around 11, 12 o'clock. So he would audit himself on three or four hours of sleep? Yeah, usually about five hours, depending on his schedule. And he would sleep until noon. It seems to me like yeah. that would be hard to do on a ship, but what do I know? Um, did, so uh, 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 did, uh, how, how commonly did he have any like prescriptions that he needed to take? The only time I know he got his prescription was um, after the motorbike accident. Uh, Laurel Watson uh, got a prescription from the local doctor in Madeira. And I'm not sure if he actually took it or not, but that's the only time I was aware of it. And I know later on at the end of his life, when he was at Creston, I know my sister as the ED of ASI, she had to get some prescriptions filled. Hmm. After but the in between all that, yeah. But in between all that, no. Hmm. Uh, by the way, for those watching, Janice's YouTube channel is Our Scientology Stories peeling the onion where uh, she and Mark Fisher talk about all the amazing stories uh, from the old days working with L. Ren Hubbard and, and also under David Miscavige. So check that out. Um, okay. So Janice, uh, you're as familiar as anybody is with the references, particularly in the early editions, first editions of these books where L. Ren Hubbard talked about using some sort of uh, drugs if necessary in Dianetics therapy sometimes. Do you remember um, all the stuff that L. Ron Hubbard Jr. said about 
uh, being on drugs when ma making up the incidents for um, history of man. Do you, does, what do you know about all this? Well, it's all just what Nib says. I don't know how true that is. I was not there. Did you ever? But let me say, did I ever meet Nibs? No. Yeah, no. But and why? He and why is gone. that? Why is that? Nibs was gone, I think, in '59, and uh, I showed up at Saint Hill in '66. Didn't Nibs then parents... come back, or or he had already no. left the second time in '59? Yeah, he did not come back. No, I mean, in his lifespan, wasn't he estranged from L. Ron Hubbard and then yes. came back? Okay, yes. but that but that was only one time. He didn't then leave again and then come back? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, okay. But, you know, a good book for that would be... Um, no, um, <laughs> Go ahead, Janice. Ben, ben Cardin's book, because he wrote that with Nibs and Sarah. Oh, wow. I've never heard of that book. Yeah. Do you know what it's called? I can look it up. I have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to know the name of that. Oh, Messiah or Madman, L. Ron Hubbard. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Ben wrote, Ben met Hubbard on the ship very briefly when he was there for the OEC FEBC. And he actually had the largest mission in Riverside. And later on, he wrote this book with Nibs and Sarah. So that's the closest to what I know of Nibs having written besides that penthouse interview he did that I know when it came out. I remember Mary Sue going into Harvard with it, and she was pissed off. <laughs> she was pissed off at, at LRH. No, at Nibs. Oh. <laughs> and also, I believe the Guardian's office uh, got Nibs to not want his name on this book because uh, they got all over him. Sure, sure. So Janice, back in the old days, um, yeah. and I guess to me that's anything before 1980, <laughs> was, because <laughs> that's when I was born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> was, was drug use either on the ship or later in Scientology, one of these things where it's like, yeah, no one's supposed to do it, but it happens. Okay. I was born into Scientology. Drug use did not happen. I have never even had an aspirin. And that's how I was raised. You just didn't have it. Yeah. And then at St. Hill, I saw no drug use. And I even asked Ken Urquhart, who was LRH's butler at St. Hill and his personal communicator, and he never saw any drugs. Hmm at St. Hill with Hubbard and he was, he was serving him food and cleaning his room and all that kind of stuff. So then on the Apollo or Royal Scotsman, the Apollo, um, there were two people I know of that were kicked off the ship for drugs for having pot. And that was John O'Keefe and Baron Berez. Oh, damn shots fired. <laughs> but um, Hubbard, Hubbard himself did not. Now, there was policy that said no drugs or alcohol within 24 hours of going in session. Since there were no drugs on the ship, we people did drink. We had parties and people drank, but they didn't drink if they were going in session the next day. Right. Now, uh, uh, without a doubt, L. Ron Hubbard was a do as I say, not as I do guy. So, and I know most Scientologists who are raised right. have never had an Advil, never had a Tylenol, but there's no question that LRH did not shy away from doing whatever he needed to do. Uh, but, 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 okay. We hear about this letter, Janice, that he wrote to, uh, who was the second wife? Was that Polly or was that Sarah? Sarah. 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 Okay. Polly was the first wife, Sarah. Okay. Now I wasn't around for that. So I can't. Right. Right. That's all just speculation or what that letter says. It says what it says. Sure. I was not around for that. I was definitely there from 1968 on that ship until 1975. Right. Well, and, and it's not like he was L not doing drugs. Well, it's not like he ever said he had never done drugs, right? No, he never said he hadn't. He, I actually thought, oh, he must have done it because he, he knew enough. Seems to know all about it, right? He knew all about it. And, Did he and ever he knew the indicators on people, you know, that were druggies and he and that's how he came up with the drug rundown. 
because we did have people come on the ship that had done drugs. Did he ever talk with you guys at that time openly about the stuff he did with Jack Parsons? No. You know, but, and, and and I mean, and I mean this literally in 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 zero disrespect. But my like my son is um, is um, twenty. No, I'm sorry, my son's thirty now. And I remember when I when you know I I had finally sat down after after coming out of prison for bank robbery and sitting down and talking to my son and apologizing and going through all of it, but. I was doing seven grams of heroin a day. I was robbing banks and my son lived in that house. And until I got caught, I had no clue. I said to him, you know, the things that you saw, he said, I don't know what you're talking about. Because I think that, I think very oftentimes it's, you know, it, it's astounding what, what kind of, uh, of drug use can be, um, how easy it is to keep drug use from people. I mean, it really is. And I'm not, okay. I'm not doubting your experience at all. I'm not, I'm just, when, when I when you read and you you hear about these long sessions that he would sit out on the boat and uh, and tell the stories to everyone, and if you just start chunking up the amount of time, the guy must have typed twenty five thousand words a second. Like he, you know what I mean? Like he had a, he really was so prolific. It just I find it staggering. And the Jack Parsons thing again, it was too. It, it really is a long time ago. But that was a uh, that's a guy that you know what they were doing there was definitely some drug laden stuff. Okay. I mean, that, Let me say this. That was the sure. Living on a ship, only if you go ashore are you going to be able to get access to drugs. Hubbard worked in on the prom deck, would go down to A deck to his dining room or to his cabin and back up to the prom deck. If we're at sea, he'd go up to the bridge. He had a cabin on the bridge. He rarely went anywhere else. And he always had a messenger with him or Mary Sue. So there is no way he could have gotten access to any drugs. He did not go ashore. He might have gone. He went ashore a few times, but for a drive, he'd take a messenger with him. But he's not, he's, he did not go ashore and go and do a drug deal with any of the locals. Well, no, but you don't have to do a drug deal. The thing with amphetamines was literally in, in, in the day, especially 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, you could buy amphetamines in a bottle of a thousand. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't. Okay. And again, I'm not, I'm just, I, I'm not discounting any of your, any of your stories. I, I am not. And I believe yeah, you a whole lot. Where is he going to keep them? He's got a steward who's cleaning these cabins and everything in it every yeah. day. From top to bottom, because that get yelled at if there was a speck of dust. So they hit every nook and cranny. They knew everything in there. I I, I hid heroin and all of the accoutrements in a prison cell that got raided by professionals. Okay. To search. You know what I'm saying? It's just I I I I believe I believe you that it, you didn't see any of that the whole time you were there. And you know what? Maybe there wasn't any of it. And I won't even discount that. I just think that there was a really hefty amount of it in this man's life, and it may not have been at all when he was on the uh, the ship. And radio. I'm not saying I'm not saying there wasn't, but I wasn't there. I am swearing for the time I was there. Yeah, and I'm not I, speculating. I, I was I there. I do not doubt you at all, and and that very well may be the case. And it was, I think, what you were saying, Aaron, before before she came on, was almost exactly that. You know, is it the kind of situation where somebody could uh, could sort of binge? And, and, you know, they, it would almost make sense. There are a lot of people who view amphetamines as a way to work. There are people that, that take um, drugs very specifically for and probably don't view it as um, abuse even, but as a way to, uh, you know, to work for 24 hours straight if you have to or, or work for 30 hours straight if you have to. I mean, it really becomes a tool like that for a lot of people. But I believe you. I, I, I don't doubt at all that. Uh, that, hmm. that go ahead. He didn't work 24 hours straight. I used it. I'm throwing that out hyperbole. Okay. I'm just saying that that's one of the reasons that, 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 uh, that people use these things. I wasn't saying that. So there's um, th this next uh, comment brings up something that I think is a, a good thing for us to discuss real quick. Is it possible some of the CERG members or high ranking members were given amphetamines masked as vitamins to work so long? Now, my answer is no, because... Uh, okay, my answer is no, but I also would have said no if anyone said to me, is there any possibility that uh, David Miscavige sits around and plays Nintendo and drinks whiskey? I would have said <laughs> no, because 
It's outside of my view. It's beyond anything I could have thought was possible. And yet the answer is yes. That's exactly what it does. He plays Nintendo and drinks whiskey. <laughs> and I would have said yes. <laughs> because you saw it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. And so that's, you know, that's an interesting thing. Like someone like me, who was never at that level, it's easy to think that my version of reality is only what I've observed. And yet even Janice has a completely different experience because she did observe so much and was there right at the highest level. So it becomes right from, from a drug standpoint, I kind of doubt that even, even if you were giving somebody a really, really, uh, um, a really weak dose of amphetamine, there are going to be some things that, that they notice are not quite right. You know what I mean? It's not a drug that I don't, th I, I would doubt that. I know nothing about the Sea Org. I just am talking about from the drug point of view. I, I doubt that they were drugging people yeah. that, that didn't know they were being drugged. Yeah. Well, sure. on the ship, on the ship, the Commodore Steward was the one who had put his vitamin package together every day in a little shot glass. There was vitamin bottles, and they even ordered the vitamins that came in from England. And they would put the pills in there. And those were the pills he took. They were all from those vitamin bottles. There were no other bottles anywhere, though I know it was said when he was in Las Palmas, Virginia Downsburg had said, oh, there was all these medications and painkillers and drugs and stuff like that. But my mother was the steward after Virginia. And I do believe that my mother would never have supported someone if she knew he was taking drugs. Now, so who's this Virginia started, person? She was the Commodore steward back in, before my mother in 67. Uh, so she's, so Virginia worked uh, for him until 67? Uh, just for a short period in the C project days. And you're saying that Virginia that's said where there I, was drugs? That's, Virginia says that. Okay. But... And she has spread that to other ex other Sea Org members, but my mother replaced Virginia later on, and I do believe my mother would not have worked for Hubbard if she knew he was doing drugs. But she okay. comes back having learned about, oh, we should take some vitamin C and let's take some vitamin E. And that's where she learned about vitamins was as LRH's steward. Did she ever mention some vitamin crack? <laughs> no <laughs> okay just wondering okay this one you're uniquely qualified to address uh jason polychron says aaron you mentioned young women around lrh routinely any evidence he was sex obsessed like so many other cult leaders uh you and i have discussed this a lot but i just wanted to give you an opportunity to address that one yeah no and, and yet he... and yet janice when you've told your stories recently um i think i heard you say in an interview with claire that it wasn't the girls' ideas to wear those skimpy outfits all the time. How do we reconcile the fact <laughs> that L. Ron Hubbard had all these little scantily clad girls working for him? How do we reconcile with the fact that we go, yeah, no, he wasn't a weirdo? Like, wh what are we doing here? What well, you you don't because yeah, he's the <laughs> one who suggests he's the one that suggested it. But now. Then you try and justify it as hot pants was the fashion in America at the time. And we're in the Caribbean, but I never thought it was appropriate for young girls on a ship representing the, the founder or, you know, the leader in hot pants. Because <laughs> there's a lot of guys who had it hot for those young girls. We were jailbait. <laughs> It's true. It's hard to tell anyone how nothing weird was going on there when uh, it just seems like it would have been. And yet, yeah, I, I think only one person ever has even implied anything un untoward um, occurred there. So make of that what you will. And, and that's my sister who said he leant down and kissed her. Uh, every other messenger will say nothing happened. Right. Yeah. So there you go. Hey, I wasn't there. Um Okay, I'm just going to address some of these real quick. Uh, Matt Wetters, not on topic, but why are all the government buildings in downtown Clearwater connected to the Scientology buildings? Um, they're not. That's the simple <laughs> answer. Um, Joni Cummings. Hi, Janice. Uh, my brother died of an overdose of sleeping pills, yeah. and that was after years of heroin, her heroin use. Heroin. 
um, heroin use. So my love and support go out to everyone here who has an addiction. Thank you, three. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, Joni. I am too. That's te- that is really, really uh, terrible. Um, but uh, thank you for the super chat. I do appreciate it. Let me see here. Um, okay, Lisa Marchbanks, Dragonfish Handmade Goods. Tommy, have you thought that maybe Hubbard was an auto writer? Auto writer? Is this a real word? Do we know what this is? I'm not sure I know what uh, what that is. I'm gonna Google it real quick. He, he was he was certainly very very prolific. Um, yeah. You know he uh, he's the most I believe he's the most published man in history. Is he not? Is not a Guinness Book of World's Record? Yeah, but it's something like because they translate a lecture into twenty languages, it counts as twenty titles. It's some stupid shit. It was well, just. A- well, however, I read. I uh, I got into a cell once and uh, the previous person who lived there uh, left in a hurry and all of his possessions were left behind. And he was a, uh, a very big fan of, uh, of Hubbard just from a um, sci- a sci-fi writer. And uh, the, I, I read the books and there was, I mean, an absolute ton. And when I got to the end of them, I was like, wait a sec, this isn't all of them. And I started reading the list of all of the other ones. Like that man wrote a lot. He definitely wrote a lot. Yeah, they also went back, and I'm pretty sure they took every magazine story he ever wrote in his early days and published it as a book, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, okay, let oh, me see. Aaron, yeah. Aaron, yeah. all his lectures, those were what were made, those were what were the books. He did lectures and they put them into the books. Like which book, for example? Most, most of his books. He'd do a lecture and then they were compiled into books. But like not Dianetics. No, but he didn't sit there and just type up a book. Those so books were compiled so, from lectures. So like even Fundamentals of Thought? I, I couldn't name the specific ones, but a lot of them were all based off lectures that were compiled. Interesting. Um, Carol Sajisayan says, what about all those smut novels he was writing at the last? She's, of course, referring to the Mission <laughs> Earth decology, which I got to tell you, I've read those things three oh. times. I'm a big fan. So am I. <laughs> I read those books and I was, I was embarrassed reading them, thinking, "Oh my God, he wrote this." I can't back that up. I just thought it would, I thought it would be funny. I, I uh, that that's part of the uh, stuff I haven't read. In fact, I didn't know about it until just recently. But uh, I'm gonna have to check that. So, Janice, I'm actually really surprised that. Um, L. Ron Hubbard didn't talk about the Jack Parson, Alistair Crowley stuff more because he certainly seemed to be quite proud of it when he would mention it on some of the St. Hill Special Briefing Course lectures. So Tom Working says Parsons did have a strong connection with Alistair Crowley, but Crowley frowned on his efforts and thought Hubbard was an idiot. It's such a, and he never met Crowley. He only knew Jack Parsons. But Tommy, what were you saying that the, the Jack Parsons stuff, there might be a pretty good reason why Hubbard didn't want to get into too much details about that, right? Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, again, for the for the times um, that that were that was in. If you, um, I'm not I'm not big into deeping. I mean, I, I'm not big into diving deep into black magic. But the uh, the stuff that uh, that Crowley did was um, the the very basis of all of it is sex, you know, and uh, and every variation of sex you could possibly come up with, and that was what uh, you know Parsons was practicing in uh, in California around the time that um, that he was hanging out with uh, with LRH. And apparently up until the time that they did a business deal together that didn't uh, go according to Hoyle. You know, there are different stories for how that ended. But uh, Parsons said that um, that LRH robbed him and took his girlfriend and uh, the money for a deal that he was uh, that he was doing. I don't know. the ver- I haven't researched any of the veracity of that. That's just how the story goes out. And I'm sure that there's two sides to that, but that's, that was Parsons take on it. But what, uh, but yeah, the, they're following, um, you know, the practices of, uh, of Crowley and his, his stuff is pretty, uh, it's racy, you know, less racy in, uh, in, in 2023, but hella racy in 19, uh, <laughs> you know, 40s and 50s. So, but I think what you're saying is that Jack Parsons' girlfriend wasn't the only one of that duo Hubbard was having relations with. Is that what you're that talking is, about? That's, a, that's just politely, yeah, you, uh, you probably said that better than I did, but um, yes, that is, uh, that is what that, uh, that infers. 
I, I mean, Janice, does it strike you? Uh, he was quite a homophobe. I mean, uh, uh, aside from his writings, was did was he pretty homophobic in how he spoke with the crew and the Sea Org members? Is there any way to shut that door? Yeah, hang on. I thought you were going to say shut that dog up. The way you said that. <laughs> you're going to shut that. <laughs> was was would Hubbard openly speak in a homophobic manner, or was it just you know through you know in his writings? Mostly in his writings, because that well, you know, we had two women on the ship who everyone believed they were together as a couple, and he used to see us their folders. But he never discussed it or tried to separate them or anything like that. The um, reason why I asked, by the way, is because Tommy's saying he's like, look, based on this black magic stuff, there is no way L. Ron Hubbard was not banging dudes with Jack Parsons. He's like, it's just that's just what that stuff was about. Is that possible? I'm say I will say this. It is not possible for him to be doing that on the ship. Oh, no, I, no, not on the ship. <laughs> Okay. Well, and I don't know about those prior years. I have no information on it at all. But I will say this. Kimma Douglas, who was the Commodore's steward and also people call her the Commodore's nurse, she was with him for a long time. And she had said to me that she was never concerned about us young girls being around him because he was senile. Senile? Yeah, senile that... during during senile means during... like you've lost your mind okay what's the word i'm looking for impotent. <laughs> oh um Impe yeah impotent. <laughs> he couldn't he couldn't salute the flag <laughs> right that's what kimma said oh <laughs> uh, <laughs> senile senile would have been better yeah. Right. Um, I, I, well, you know, that's funny because in L. Ron Hubbard's affirmations that were admitted into court, he does say in his affirmations some stuff about like his inability to perform. You are a right. virile lover who can, you know, go for hours. And like, you, that's not what you're affirming yourself unless you've got a problem in that department. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. Right. Um, he thinks thou doth protest too much. Now, come to think of it, I'd have to look through his affirmations again. I don't think there was in anything in there about you are not attracted to men. You love women. I don't remember anything in there about that. Do you? Well, you know, in in his defense, right? Look, in his defense, the uh, this was very much geared, whether they were participating in this because he really likes that as a concept. The idea behind what they were trying to do was bring on the Antichrist. By all of the writings that that came out from that period, they were trying to uh, to bring, you know, on the uh, the the second, you know, the 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 end of the world by bringing Antichrist into uh, into existence, and that was the goal. So maybe he wasn't a full time thing. He was definitely very into the black magic aspect of it. By all things written about it, I think the fascination was there. He did participate in what they were doing there, but he might have been. Uh, well, all right, fine, I'll do this. You know what I mean? We really are trying to bring in the Antichrist. So what the hell, I'll do it. You know what I mean? It might, it might not have been one of those, boy, I've been waiting my whole life for this moment. It might just have been yeah, I'll take one. The uh, bullet kind of a thing. I'll take one for the team. I haven't could use a little pro protein shot in their Starbucks every I, now and then. You know what I I'm saying? I swear to you, I was waiting to hear if you were going to say take one for the team. I swear <laughs> to you, I was waiting. <laughs> Okay, here's the, here's the last few, and we'll uh, we'll wrap this up. <laughs> Irish size says hypergraphia is a disorder linked with epilepsy. I think hypergraphia is, is that when you're just writing nonstop. I I don't know, guys. I grew up in a cult. Lisa Marchbanks says auto writing came from spiritualism or the belief that spirits can interact with the living. Oh. It involves a subject, the writer, moving their pencil without being conscious of what they're writing. Oh yeah. boy. I mean, if LRH was an auto writer, he would have blamed it on his body things, right? Um, you know what? Madam, Madam, what's her name? Madam, yeah, I know what that is now. I didn't, uh, yeah, I was confused. Thank you for uh, for explaining that. What were you going to say, Janice? Yeah, when when Hubbard would write, he would go. Sometimes he'd just go on automatic, and he'd just he didn't he didn't type in those days. He just wrote. Everything was handwritten with a carbon copy, and he would sit there, and his leg would be bouncing up and down. 
like this while he's just writing away. And a messenger can be standing on the other side of the desk reading everything as he writes it. And the messenger's not there in his world and a cigarette will be burning out in the ashtray while he's just writing and writing and just flipping pages and writing and writing. And then he might sit there and look up and go back and start writing again. It was like an automatic thing. I can tell what Tommy's thinking. Oh, yeah, don't, don't, don't do anything. It sounds like he was very, very uh, uh, efficient. Smoke one cigarette after another. Well, Jacked up on amphetamines. Those, those, those things are killers. Those cigarettes are killers. Could his cigarettes have been laced? Could that have been the secret? No. No. Uh, anything. Well, anything. Okay. Tarkina Meyer says amphetamine psychosis is a real thing and happened to a lot of soldiers in World War II. They were given amphetamines because uh, they helped them stay awake. It wasn't considered a drug like heroin or something back then. Yeah. It was like considered like candy. Well, you know, it was also a, it was also a slightly different version of the, uh, of the substance than what's getting cranked out right now. What? Let's not forget. Hubbard was an enlisted man in World War II. He could have been exposed to that stuff at that time. Well, that could have explained that yeah. uh, the uh, the dumping of all of the uh, the depth charges on a, a log. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't know. We're that's... selling a Mexican <laughs> island because this is good shit. Have you tried this shit? <laughs> There's a submarine underneath us. <laughs> Get it, past that pill and load up another depth charge. Oh, my God. Tassie Devil says, Jill Goodman, messenger. Did you know Jill Goodman? Very well. She was my cabin mate. Jill Goodman, messenger, said post the motorbike accident was a personality yeah. change. You've mentioned this as well. But yeah. what do you attribute the personality change to? Well, I've always attributed to the accident. I mean, you know, I was there on watch when he came back from the accident. He had been told that morning that he was not allowed in Spain. So he was pretty upset about another country that he can't enter. And after that, he, well, he was in a lot of pain in his cabin. And I've told the story about the red chair and he couldn't sleep. And we'd have to tie him into the chair so that... He <laughs> Janice. It's a little wilder than I thought. This is now, now, the truth is coming out. now the truth is coming out. He wasn't that senile, was he? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm what kidding. was that prescription he had again? It wasn't Vivitrol's Viagra. It wasn't Dick Okay. <laughs> okay. He couldn't sleep because if he laid down, he hurt. So... We got a red chair out of storage and he'd, we'd lower him into the chair and then we'd put cotton padding around the chair for his arm so that it was comfortable. And um, you know how when you fall asleep sitting up, your head kind of sometimes knocks back? Mm -hmm. It would do that or it would knock forward. So it would wake him up. So then we had this bright idea and we got a scarf. <laughs> And we tied his head back like this. Right. So LRH was on the nod. Let me get this straight, right? So in drug lingo, we would say LRH was in there, right? On his pain meds and on the nod, right? And you guys strapped him with the headband? Yes. Please tell no. me there's a photo of that somewhere. No, there isn't. Oh. But, and he, but, you know, we'd stay in there until he fell asleep. And one day, oh, we had a tripod for his arm to be hanging in. <laughs> one day, there's three messengers and they're sneaking <laughs> out. They're sneaking out of the cabin. And the last messenger kicks the tripod. <laughs> oh, my God. It was like all hell broke loose. <laughs> and then it's okay, then you have to start again, putting him back to sleep in the chair. Oh my god. You know what? That the the subscriber you have that has the SPTV uh tattoo, there's your next tattoo. L LRH sitting there arm on a tripod, <laughs> right? Got, <laughs> head head tied tied. <laughs> on a big red chair. That is a tattoo waiting to happen. Oh, I'm sorry. Gosh, that's, that's funny as hell, though. That really is. That is really I gotta awesome. tell you so though, that, that makes that makes LRH just seem so much more relatable. I got to be honest. He's just one of the boys Human. getting tied, right. getting tied to a chair by a bunch of 
<laughs> bunch of exactly. young women. Crazy. Please tell me you got. A, please tell me you got a Is sharpie this? and then drew things on his face when he fell asleep. It sounded a lot yeah. like my college days. You're like, sounds like Tijuana. No, we were on a <laughs> ship. <laughs> <laughs> oh lord almighty that is funny but you know what the, it, it sounds like the uh, the ship was a good time every time i hear anybody talk about it it sounds like the ship was a good time <sighs> you know the fun was had by all yeah. it's one of those crazy things right if you if you hear soldiers talking about their their time at war you might think it was a good time as well because sometimes you just make the best of it man you do you make the best of it you know what? That that's a phenomenon that I find fascinating because I, I will I will go about my life and I will do whatever I do, and there are long stretches where I forget the fact that I was a, a drug addict and a uh, and a criminal. And then I'll run into somebody who says, "Oh, I was in the feds," and you go, "Really? Where where did you do time?" And and in two seconds, that you just sort of fall back into kind of lockstep, and it's and it's always the joking stuff and the laughing about it. And it was hell. It really was. But the, by the time you're done and it's over, the funny stories are the ones that sort of that last because the yeah. other ones are too depressing to tell. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap it up guys. Before we, uh, before we do, let me remind everybody uh, Janice's channel is our Scientology stories, peeling the onion. And let me see if I can get back to Tommy's Tommy's uh, channel is the life boat i'm still shocked that you were able to actually get that that handle at the lifeboat it's amazing um right. both channels are absolutely fantastic guys uh go over there and 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 check them out janice thank you for joining us tommy as always thank you. Welcome. such thank a you pleasure to meet you janice that was great hey ron thank you, you all all right guys thanks for watching thanks everybody Bye. who watches until the very end we'll talk to you soon okay if you want to see my rock and roll songs Quiet on this guitar. And if you want to see a, a different one of my videos, uh, then you could click right inside here. If you have subscribed or not, subscribe right here. Bye!